Yeah, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, so we're just gonna start with a, just community agreements, just in case we do get into any discussion points. So one thing, um, you know, we always just like to define the space a little bit, just so we know parameters. Um, obviously this is a confidential space within reason that it's being recorded. So, you know, be discerning of what you share. We're, you know, um, so it's confidential, but also professional. So, <laughs> you know, just so we know kind of the tone. Um, what's learned here can leave here and what is shared here within reason stays here. So if there's something private that you want to share with one of us, that's fine. That's, that's not gonna, like that would be like a direct, a direct message to Natasha or I, okay? That would stay here. That would be like a professional um, message that's, or like, you know, a DM. <laughs> um, yours and all voices are equally welcome and um, please speak from your own experience. And um, I just say refrain from giving advice. Um, of course, that's it. Of course, speaking from your own experience is great. We're just talking about just kind of, if you have any questions or insights, of course, you know, um, that's always something that we like to see, so. Um, and then of course, please take yourself where, where, wherever feels safest as you hear, if you listen to this, a lot of folks in here and are tired and have, have had long days. So feel free if you need to turn the computer around and just take it in auditorily. This is universal design, you know, we're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome for receiving the benefit of the way, you know, it's meta, it's metacognition there, right there. <laughs> so um, feel free to take advantage of the thing you're being trained trained on for your own mental health <laughs> benefits. <laughs> so anyway, so I've, I know I've taken a couple of trainings, you know, just sitting on my couch, listening to that from, you know, with the computer <laughs> away from me. <laughs> so I worked with a client this morning who first thing they said when they came in was, my camera's staying off today. And I said, well, if you don't mind, so is mine. <laughs> yeah. Totally, totally, totally good. Okay, so um, a little bit, so we're, we're starting now kind of in that trauma-informed versus universal designed mo modality. So, um, you know, when Natasha and I were talking about this course, we were like, okay, where do we begin? Because, um, you know, everyone comes from it comes to universal design from a different space and it's very much an interdisciplinary understanding which is one thing natasha and i are passionate about is that it's not it, it, it's either for architects or it's for educators and then it kind of gets dropped from there and that's actually not true like at all so natasha do you want to speak more to that piece of the interdisciplinary parts of it yep so every space which basically means a, pa a place where people exist, so literally everywhere, has the potential to apply the principles of universal design to that space. And that basically really comes down to the fact that we can do whatever we can in our homes, in our work environments, out in our community, to ensure that the principles that we're talking about here today are applied to the highest level possible in any space in which we have a little bit of control. That's our own home. You know, I think a lot of people have maybe had experience with an older relative who has reached the point of needing a walker or a wheelchair to get around for safe mobility. And suddenly that relative can no longer come to family gatherings at your home because there's maybe one step up into the house. And while we can't necessarily put a ramp on every house, it would be wonderful if we did, and there were more accessible and available choices for people who needed that, it's not a reality. And so what do we change to ensure that we can still have those people present at those family gatherings? And a lot of the time it's going to them wherever they are. So a lot of folks, um, at least in this training, are coming with an understanding of trauma-informed practices. And whenever I get in this conversation with folks that have history, you know, that are well-versed in trauma-informed work, I'm like, they're like, well, I want my trauma-informed work to be accessible. And I'm like, all right, it is. <laughs> you know, we're talking about psychological access in trauma work, but with universal design, and this is what I get a lot, I'm like, if you go from the universal design perspective, you will innately be trauma-informed, innately, okay? Because trauma-informed work 
is just differentiated intervention for different psychological, di different brains, right? <laughs> and guess what? So is universal design. <laughs> So that's the cool part about universal design is it's working smarter, not harder, right? And um, the minute you start to work from that lens, you're already trauma-informed. <laughs> so there's a, so if you look to that table that's in, on page, um, I don't know, it's, it's on that first, if you click it, it's, it's, it says trauma-informed care on one side and universal design for learning. And we kind of break down the basics of that, which you can definitely read. I just kind of gave you the Eclipse Notes version of that. <laughs> but you can see that it's, you know, we're talking about, and we're gonna go into de each detail of that. So I'll kind of be uncoupling those in each other part of the universal design, but you can kind of, this will kind of give you a rough idea from a get-go, from those that are coming at this from a clinical standpoint, you to kind of see how they break down and where there's similarities. Because really, if you're doing it on the, le the left-hand side, it's universal design, you'll get it on the right-hand side. It'll automatically be trauma-informed, okay? Any more on that one before we move on? Okay, so social model of disability. Oh, here we go. <laughs> this is your fundamental takeaway, folks. Pull out the highlighter, whatever your means of learning is, and really integrating. If you take nothing else from anything that Julia or I say right here, this table right here on this handout, these things I'm going to be talking about right here, this is it. Here's your neon sign. Okay? So, social model of disability versus medical model of disability. Medical model is the one that we see most often in education systems, in the medical system where it first came from, in many of our rehabilitative settings. Just the word rehabilitation by its nature implies prescriptive and fixing what's wrong. Now by training, I am a rehabilitation counselor, meaning that if you're taking the term literally, my sole training was in fixing something that was broken. That is not the way as somebody with a disability we want to go about the world. We don't want to be seen as the broken thing that is incomplete, that's missing a part, that has something that is so far outside of the norm that we are viewed as incapable in some way. That doesn't mean that that thing doesn't exist. It's word choice. And so a better description of what a rehabilitation counselor does is they're a habilitation specialist. So to rehabilitate means to fix something and bring it back to a standard that previously existed. To habilitate means to take something that doesn't exist and provide a skill set and an experience that didn't exist in the first place. So in other words, if you are teaching somebody who has a birth congenital condition that impacts the spinal cord, if you're teaching that person to walk and they've never walked before, that's habilitation. If you are teaching someone who has had a stroke at the age of 60 to walk again, that is rehabilitation. Again, that is presuming that walking is the most effective means of locomotion for that individual. It may not be. There is a view among the medical world and the educational world that what is most commonly seen in society is the most desirable and most effective and what should be strived for. The difference in the social model of disability when you start to get people with disabilities at the table, rather than the professional medical person being the expert in the disabled person's experience, is the person with a disability or the disabled person is the expert in their experience. They may not have all the skills to mitigate every circumstance they encounter, but they have the ability to work as a member of the team 
not just to be directed, manipulated, any of those things. The choice is a key factor in working from a social model. Fundamentally, the social model of disability places the responsibility for making accommodations, modifications, and alternate means of doing something, both the responsibility of the person who has a disability impairment or handicap and the responsibility of able-bodied individuals or individuals with different experiences around that person. So again, that responsibility is shared between people experiencing a condition, impairment or disability, and the person who is also involved in the scenario, so society as a whole. When we look at social model of disability versus medical model of disability, the medical model is very prescriptive. Do these things and this will happen. It negates the fact that sometimes you can do those three things and the other thing still can't happen. It creates a culture of failure rather than a culture of collaborative success. How I read looks very different than someone who has optic nerves reads. That doesn't mean that I don't read. As a matter of fact, when I read Braille, I read with the visual part of my brain, or what's left of it anyway. I don't read it with the tactile center of my brain. I still read. I, my brain may not have a visual center, and I still see. That doesn't mean that any vision therapy was going to make that part of my brain see that was supposed to see. There will always be that missing part of my brain. Nothing will fix that. So understanding that the way that I read is a, a very clear example is just as valid as the person who picks up something in its print and reads it is a really hardcore fundamental piece. And that's just a very night and day example for you. There's lots of other things. The person who does mountain pose seated in a chair, but they're attacking and performing the function of that pose axial extension, elongation of the spine, you know, centering of the body, the person who does that in the chair, same exact pose as the person who chooses to do it standing, the person who does it supine on the floor, the person who does it prone on the floor, the person who does it in bed. It's all still mountain pose. It's really, really important that we focus on the collaborative and inclusive pieces of the discussion. In the disability justice community, really back from its inception and the start of the word inclusion, we developed a phrase as a community and that is nothing about us without us. It's highly integrated into the social model of disability, meaning the people making the decisions in a space have a voice and get choices in the implementation of any interventions that are involved. And this is where social model of disability, universal design and trauma-informed care start to really hardcore intersect. So I've gotten some notifications about things in the chat. Give me a second to pop over with my screen reader and just check anything out there. It was me talking about the who. Let me save you the I muted my screen reader for a second while I was talking, so it didn't distract me, but then it started yeah. dinging at me. Yeah, no, just, look, I was like, I was like, it's stuff you already know. I was just telling Laura that we will, I'll, I'll say this auditorily too, just in case someone, uh, people can't see that, see that it's, um, their, their computer's turned away. Um, the social model of disability does come from um, a clinical um, research from the World Health Organization, and there is um, a training on that. Um, and I will, not a training, I'm sorry, a uh, write-up on that that I will send to you all so you have like a little bit of some work on your own. Hey, Laura, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, is it okay to ask a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Please. Okay, um, 
so let's see if I can put this in an articulate way. Um, the definition that Natasha just gave us of the social model is a lot more comprehensive and actually more interesting to me than the one that I usually hear, where um, it seems like it's common for the difference between the two to be just depicted as the social model is about um, the limitations being on the cultural side and the medical model being uh, focusing limitations in the mind or body of the disabled person. And so then inevitably the argument comes up that the social model can be uh, marginalizing to a certain degree because there are some people, um, and I fall into this category sometimes, where um, it, it, it really isn't the culture that's causing limitation. It's, it's, it is something in the body, for instance, chronic pain, um, something that, that, that keeps me from doing things, and there's never going to be a way that the culture is going to fix that. And so there's some arguments that, that, um, the social model kind of erases that, um, and people kind of talk about a hybrid model. From the description that Natasha just gave, that seems to me to be a much better description that doesn't narrow this, the, the, the narrow it down to that that dichotomy. And so I guess my question is: is that is that um, common? thing that comes up, is that like an, a misinterpretation of the models or is it um, just that we didn't just, we didn't talk about that part of it, I guess. Maybe that part of it's outside the scope of yeah. it. Does it that question make sense? It does. It makes total sense. Thanks. Uh, yes. It's a little bit of both actually. Um, and okay. people have often seen the social model of disability and the medical model of disability as kind of opposite ends of a spectrum. And it's like, well, you're either going to be one or you're going to be the other. And there are times where the medical model is necessary. And often that's places like qualifications for services where there's mm. government mandated funding involved. Right. Okay. Um, for example, in order to get services from rehabilitation services for the blind, you have to be blind or visually impaired. You all right. have a condition that may lead to blindness. You know, you can't just walk in off the street and be like, I want you to pay for me to learn Braille. Well, right. you can, you as somebody who's sighted, you can learn Braille. You can pay a Braille teacher to even teach you Braille. You can take a course, but nobody's going to pay for that for you because it's not a necessary skill to mitigate your access to the environment. Doesn't mean you can't do it. So, um, so a lot of the time when we're looking at the definition of social model that I gave, it's there's, the intersectional piece gets dropped for our black and white thinking as a society. And it looks in a way we're looking at, well, what's the opposite of saying something's wrong with someone? And that is saying that, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. You just do things differently. And that's true, and like, nothing is going to change the fact that I can't see. Okay? Frankly, I will have that condition and impairment forever until we learn to regenerate nerve cells. Okay? And even then, I might be so old that I decide I don't want to go there. But, so I still have technically something wrong with me, air quotes. That won't be fixed. What the social model of disability tells me is that I am not broken because this thing physically in my body is broken, or that I think differently in my own neurodiversity as a result of brain trauma. I, it's also the shared responsibility between the people around me. And there are things that can change in the environment, not physically in the environment, but culturally, social, emotionally in the environment that ease my access to spaces, that ease my 
my psychological presence when chronic pain may come into play. To say that I have to back out of this because it's a sensory overstimulating environment and if I come, I will pay too big for it tomorrow to be able to show up today. The, the social model of disability says that we should look at that environment that is preventing me from being able to participate and assess if there's anything that can be altered that would increase my participation physically in that environment, emotionally in that environment, and socially in that environment. And that might be introducing the component of a hybrid model where folks come in person and folks come in Zoom and they get integrated into the same thing. So I don't physically have to go into that space, but if I'm not zoomed out and that does make that more available to me, or people who might join an event via phone versus via video, because that makes it more available. It doesn't take away the presence of the block, but it opens up the opportunity for participation in the presence of the block. Yeah, and, and Natasha just is building at, okay, what do you do with that information? <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you do with this information? And that's where universal design comes in, right? And that's where we start Lay to- Lay in the framework right here. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, so as we move into that, you know, so for um, space holders, human service providers of all kinds, you know, well, knowing that information, what do I do? Well, welcome to non-dual thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, universal design, one thing I've heard from clinicians that I've talked to about this that they love about it is it takes us into really having to use inquiry to assess our intervention because there's no black and white answer. There's like, we can give you a framework. It's just like trauma-informed care. We can give you a framework, but at the end of the day, you have to make the, the call that's right for the space and use it in partnership with the folks in this space. Because again, like trauma-informed care, it's peer support and non and non-hierarchical um, relationships, right? Same thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, so I'm just gonna go through kind of these questions that you can ask. They're underneath the sheet under the table that says models of disability. So I'm just gonna ask, just kind of bring these to your head, just to kind of get into this, just to kind of recite these, just so you can kind of maybe tomorrow or maybe as you're planning your spaces virtually and in person, what do I need to do? What kind of mindset should I be in as I start to kind of shift into this lens, this kind of universally designed lens, right? These are some guiding questions you can ask yourself. What is the purpose? It says lesson, my lesson plan or intervention. That also means yoga, by the way. <laughs> um, what skills are we addressing? Is there a timeline? Which skills will require more direction or instruction? What skills can be accomplished independently? Where are the barriers to accessing the intervention? How can I implement universal design access within my plan? What might I need to consider for individual modifications? How might I structure my intervention? Example, large group small group, pairs, or individual? All of those questions pretty much apply, can apply. Maybe not everyone will apply to every situation, but almost all of those, that structure can apply to almost every person that works with a human being, even doctors. <laughs> so just some guiding questions to think through as you kind of, you know, start to kind of put your mind around some of these things. Um, okay, so universal design at its whole. Um, is, I mean, it's, it's a lot of things, <laughs> you know, you can, you can, that's why it's interdependent, it, it's interdisciplinary. You can use it in architecture, you can use it in yoga, you can use it in the schools, you can use it in, in your clinical work, right? There is no place with human beings that you cannot, it does not apply. <laughs> Hence why we're doing this. So there's three guidelines in it and it there's, and we're going to go through each guideline and we're going to start with the one that's the most like trauma informed work. Okay. <laughs> so you can go in any order. Um, lots of times, depending on the people, um, it can, sometimes people start with representation, but we're starting because engagement is the one that's probably the most like 
the trauma-informed practices work, um, but obviously it goes into multi, it's multifaceted. So, so the first principle is that we're talking about is called engagement. And with engagement, we're looking at the why of learning, okay? So the why of learning, why are we even learning these things? And when I mean learning, any human being, even in clinical work is learning. People with histories of trauma are learning different skills to work through the nervous system, right? Um, many things, they're learning lots of things in therapy. That's why Natasha and I use the word learners. <laughs> Do you wanna speak more to that, Natasha? Sure, so the big reason that I started using learners when I was working in the educational system is to get out of the hierarchy. Teacher and student implies a hierarchy. And sometimes the hierarchy reduces an individual's psychological access to being able to learn, so to the actual learning. And I wanted it to be clear to even my very young students, as young as two and a half when I first started working with them, that I have never stopped learning either. Just because I'm teaching something, I also expect to learn from that person. So while I am operating in the role of a teacher when I'm leading an asana class, there's not a class that I walk away from that something didn't come up with a student that I go, okay, well, I learned how to problem solve through something new, or I didn't anticipate that, and I did this in response to it, and so stick that into the toolbox now. Learners really is a more inclusive term that provides a level of fluidity in our interaction. Yeah, because we're all learning. You all are learners. <laughs> you know, um, you know, and I'm learning, you know, we're all learners. So it's a universal design you know, um, title, right? We're all learners. So um, anyway, so in, in engagement from Universal Design, we're really looking at how we can use, um, how we can, an you know, how we can look at the why, right? So we're kind of answering that question in our space. What's the why of learning? And in that, some principles you can use or some actions, just some basic that I have on the sheet are, you know, offering voice and choice. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> That sounds kind of like trauma-informed practices, doesn't it? That's why we're doing this first, <laughs> because it's the one that's the most familiar to many of you. Um, it's just under a different umbrella here. Um, you can design your interventions to reach the needs of a student's personal goal. Does that also sound familiar? That we that people have their own personal goals in in how they want what they want to learn, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, engages real life learning experiences. Um, yeah. So we're looking at, with engagement, we're looking at how can we make our intervention applicable to our learner? How can we make it applicable to them? How can we make what we're doing, what we're training on, how can we make it real and meaningful? We're creating meaning in the engagement part. We're building meaning, okay? Which also is a part of lots of times trauma-informed practices. Definitely trauma-informed yoga. Um, it also, again, we also offer learner feedback. We ask for feedback right? Um, we create those opportunities to, to ask for feedback in different ways. You can do a survey or you can just ask. I've been doing so many trainings the last three days. My feedback is just like, email me back your thoughts <laughs> because I don't have time to create a form. So, but that's still asking for feedback, right? Because I'm inquiring what people, you know, what are your thoughts? Let me know, you know? So it's just creating the space to receive it, even if it's a box with, in a classroom, I'm just saying in a classroom, like a box with just like, you know, put your, you know, drop it in or send me a, a message on, you know, direct message, you know, saying it right what now. Are those virtual and non boxes that are right. out there. And if you've never had exposure to those, go look them up. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and also, again, going back to integrates learners lived experiences. Um, we're going to go into this in, a, in another segment, but really bringing in so like, you know, in the representation component, they all intersect, but like, you know, having representation of, you know, marginalized folks um, in your marketing, you know, in your, um, in, in books, you know, in posters, you know, um, mirroring back the, those, um, the experiences of uh, the folks in your space, right? Um, so that's the why. We're making meaning, we're integrating, and then also regulation. Okay, we're also looking at how can we make them engaged, 
And engagement also means looking at the nervous system. This is just by, by the way, my adaptation. This is not technically in it, but it's just the blending <laughs> of the things. But this would be, if we're looking, if we're making it trauma-informed, we would put the nervous system in there. And how can I help someone um, come to a space of feeling a sense safety-ish so they can engage and create meaning for themselves in a space? Um, any more on that before we move forward? I'm just going to start kind of taking questions as bef so before we move into, so before we move on to the next component, any questions about engagement? Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay. Any more on for you, Natasha? Do you want to, anything on that? I think we're good. Trying okay. to keep on top of our time to yeah, be respectful oh, totally. of everyone's time. Totally. Okay, representation. I'll let you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> so representation, I'm going to make this much shorter than the previous sections, because while it is important, it's really easy to sum up pretty quick. Who is saying what is being said is as important as what is being said. Who is saying what needs to be said is as important as what is being said. Again, it goes back to that nothing about us without us. That goes not just for disability groups, but any group of people. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a saying that women deserve to be in all the places where decisions are being made. Rooted right in this, it's exactly the same thing. Who is at the table, who has a voice at the table is the important piece. So Julie can talk to her students with visual impairment and blindness about the real world and the adult world until she's blue in the face. I come in and say the exact same thing and they go, oh, okay, moving on, next thing, got it. And it's because they heard it from somebody who has a shared lived experience in that particular area. No matter how much observational and academic knowledge somebody has on say an issue of racism. If the person coming in and talking about it, the only person coming in and talking about it has light skin, their experience and what they relay is going to be incomplete. Not, not, not valid, still valid, just incomplete. Because it's going to be missing the peace and the power of that experience of someone who lives with darker skin saying the exact same thing. And I will just add on, because we talked about a little bit that mentoring piece is also really important here. And that's obviously from the lens of disability for sure. You know, it's, and it, it can go just that concept of mentoring someone with similar lived experiences and looking at that. You know, I know that like big brothers, big sisters, organizations like that do look at those things. Those are just common examples I'm trying to give as we um as we learn about these um this but like that's you know they like pair mentors with you know younger kids you know based off of um lived experiences that's a prime example of this okay action and expression is the um third one so in action and expression, we're really looking at the how of learning. Representing, rep, sorry, representation was the what of learning. It's what are we learning, okay? Um, action and expression is the how. How are we gonna do this, okay? And what, by what means am I gonna access this information, this space, okay? This is where we get assistive technology, okay? This is where a lot of assistive tech comes in. Um, which if you take the the month, the self-paced course and supported course that go, we go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, but this is where like Surrey, <laughs> you know, where we talk about like, you know, just some of those different universally designed accessibility pieces. But um, with action and expression, we look at um, how students can also self-monitor and reflect opportunities. And how can we apply what we know and demonstrate our knowledge in multiple ways? Right, standardized testing, good example. Good example of what's not working. <laughs> so, standardized testing, not universally designed. 
Um, you can also, you know, a couple of things you can do, you know, when you're kind of looking at, I mean, this is any kind of evaluation, not just school, clinical, all sorts of ways. You know, you can look at writing, recording, drawing, constructs, self-paced, you know, I mean, there's a, especially the folks in allied health, as speech language pathologists, you know, um, I know they really look at doing their evaluations from this lens for sure. So, um, you know. And the sky's the limit here, really. Yeah. If your initial thing is, you know, write a five paragraph essay on the benefits of organic food, does it really need to be written, actually written? Is that what you're testing? Or are you testing the knowledge of the benefits of eating organic food? Because then if you're actually testing whether this person understands the benefits of organic food over non-organic food, then they don't need to write with their hand and paper and pencil. They don't need to type it out on a keyboard. They can sit down and have a conversation with you and verbally share their knowledge. They can draw you a diagram they can paint a picture. They can create a model that illustrates and compares and contrasts the benefits of organic food over non-organic food. Yeah, you know, and I think for, you know, the same thing for yoga, you know, our students can demonstrate how they do different things. They're, you know, their shapes in this way too, like start to, I know we have a lot of yoga teachers in here, which is why I was like, kind of just kind of putting some brains in there about how can you add action and expression, you know, in your yoga practice, you know, sky's the limit, right? Demonstrating what, what your, your student, what your learners know. Um, and I think also the self-paced content, um, you know, sometimes it's for folks, sometimes it's not. Um, but we saw, we saw this in when, when we went for, when I think Natasha and I's minds, you know, when, when we all went to like virtual learning, we were like, oh my gosh, look at like what, all these things we have to do now, you know, but universal design supports that, you know, you, it's, we're not creating something new. We're just bringing in things we other places already knew. And we're just like, Hey, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Everyone architecture already kind of brought it to the forefront. And so did education. We just want to bring it in a little closer here you know but you now you have asynchronous learning now you have hybrid now we have all these choices for accessibility and what do we do with it and how do we design with it right and these frameworks can kind of help us kind of put our heads in that space and kind of organize it a little bit anything else on action and expression no um Okay, so if you have any questions or comments here, um, of course, like we have, I think we, I think we got through our stuff kind of early. I've <laughs> got about quarter till. So. Yeah, so we do have time for questions um, or comments. Um, if you have any, of course, um, I'm sure lots of, if we finish early, that's okay too. <laughs> um, there will be a transcript that I'll put out if you want to read your content, <laughs> so. Um, oh, hey, Laura. Hi, um, I got another question, but I wanted to wait a minute and see if anybody else, since I already took some of your time, if there's anybody else who had questions first, but if nobody else is asking. You're the only that, hand at the moment, so go ahead. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. so um, one of the things that I guess I find confusing confusing about I don't know if it, it's a, it's sort of a combination of confusion and concern about universal design in the sense that the name bothers me because universal implies that it's universal and I can see how there are a lot of situations where if you know who is going to be in a space that's designed architecturally or a learning environment for specific types of people, um, you can, you know, you, you might be able to do a really good job of making sure that it's accessible to everybody who's planning to be there. Um, but then when you get into things like yoga classes, um, online classes, a whole lot of other kinds of things, if you don't know who's going to be there, 
it's it doesn't seem to me like it's really possible to make it accessible to everybody and then that gets further complicated by the fact that if you have several students with different needs in your class it's always possible for some of those needs to be mutually exclusive and so to me it seems like in a real world situation it's impossible to say this is universally accessible and while I understand that the idea of universal design is a process and a, and a, and a, and a way of working with it that doesn't necessarily imply that you're going to be 100% effective, it seems to me like there needs to be a message somewhere in there because of you know what Natasha had said a little while ago about how we like to do black and white thinking in this culture, that as soon as you say the word universal, people are going to assume that means that you're guaranteeing that this is accessible to everybody. And I'm kind of, I guess I'm just kind of wondering about what your thoughts are on that and where you see that kind of, you know, naming, being transparent and naming that kind of caveat in, in, in the midst of all of this. So universal design, yeah, so universal design by its nature means that you are meeting the needs of the vast majority of the people to the best of your ability. Again, it's a practice, not a perfect, and I say that around yoga all the time. I've been teaching universally designed yoga classes pretty much since the inception of my teaching in 2013. I regularly teach classes that I don't know who's going to show up, and I have wheelchair users show up. I have 81-year-olds show up. I have 21-year-old able-bodied people show up. I have somebody with dual sensory impairment show up, and I have somebody show up who maybe needs a sign language interpreter, and I don't have one. And yet, we all do yoga together, and everybody has an inclusive experience. Everybody doesn't have the same experience. They share a practice. They do different versions of the same fundamental pieces of the poses. They all look different. A friend and yoga teacher of mine, uh, together we have a saying that we use all the time and that this is not synchronized yoga dance here, folks. This is everyone having a yoga experience and practicing yoga in parallel ways that are not identical. And so part of being able to instruct in a universally designed way means giving people freedom to choose not to do something if it doesn't feel right to them, do something else instead, as well as being able to do their version and explore and find their version. They don't know. I don't know necessarily. I can't predict everyone's needs. I can predict a variety of needs and provide choices and use phrases like, what would happen if you X, Y, or Z? Or in draw your attention to see what would happen if, notice where you feel a sensation of. And maybe by saying those multiple things, yeah, notice where you feel a sensation of something, say a stretch in your back leg in Warrior One to the person who has no feeling in that leg. They don't feel the sensation, but if I say to draw your attention to a sensation or a particular part of the body, this, you know, that individual may know, okay, I bring my hand to that leg and the sensation is what I feel through my hand, not what I feel through my leg. Does that make more sense? Um, it makes a lot of sense and it isn't quite what I was getting at. I guess um, a good example for what I'm trying to get at would be um, something that's actually I've come across actually is let's say that you have a fairly small room and you have two people that show up, one of whom has extreme sensory issues around scents and smells and another person who really truly needs essential oils for, say, to fight off migraines. Um, and you have these two people in a room together. Those 
those are not just different ways of experiencing the practice, but they, but if they don't both get what they need, the 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 room is actually inaccessible to them, um, and so you can't solve that problem without one of the people not getting what they need. And so I guess that's where I'm coming from with. Um, what I see as a concern is that if if a class is or anything is represented as being universally available and that's taken at face value and then somebody shows up and it's not accessible to them, that's further marginalizing to somebody who's already marginalized. And so it seems to me like it's really important to be transparent about and, and upfront about how the terminology around universal design and, or you know accessible to all is really about best effort, not about a guarantee. And um, I guess that's kind of what I was getting at. So yeah, I don't know universal if design specific. is not equal to available to 100% of people 100% of the time because that doesn't exist. Nothing is 100% available to 100% of people 100% of the time, even when those people are fully able-bodied and have no conditions or impairments. Um, Kat, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so just real quick and kind of along the lines of this conversation around terminology and language and how, how much impact even just a slight change of a word or a phrase could land with a learner. I was wondering if there are any resources that you know of that can guide in language transition and coming into awareness of, you know, inclusive language, anti-oppressive language, like the non, yeah, the non-offensive terms, the non, um, the non-inclusive terms. Yeah. Are there any books or resources out there that you know of? Um, the short answer is reach out to me and I will hook you up kind of, I can work with you in a coaching mentality on this, um, because like with the rest of the world, the instant we put something out in print, it's outdated. And so the best thing is to find out from the particular populations of people to the best of your ability, what is their preferred language? Just like pronouns have become something that we're trying to infiltrate, asking people about what are your preferred pronouns, so is general terminology. You've heard me multiple times throughout this course use person with a disability and disabled person, refer to myself as blind or neurotypical, as well as person who has a visual impairment or a student with visual impairment. That's to show that everybody has their preference. There's not one right or wrong way. And so the best way to start to frame your thinking is to become more inquisitive with the individuals you encounter. Following and listening, being an active listener and finding out what terminology that person uses to reference themselves and their condition. Do they call it a disability? Do they call it an impairment? Do they use the word gimpy? You know, and then finding out if it's okay for you to mirror that language because they might refer to themselves in one way but if you as an able-bodied person or just a person who's not them use that same term, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> uh, hey, and to Laura's point, um, I, I sat in Laura's, the, Laura, the question Laura was asking, and I was just had a thought. Laura, I think it's absolutely okay to ask people if they have a need. Like, I mean, and you, you know, it's just, I think it's okay. And even if they don't know, you don't know. I mean, it's okay. And it's, I think it's a good practice for folks to, I mean, you're not asking, you can say, is there any additional needs that I need to be aware of? You know, that's, it's okay to ask those questions. I think one thing as a space holder, like take the pressure off of thinking you have to know it all because you can't, <laughs> you know, it's not possible. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So that's the, in Natasha and I have had a lot of conversations around that and it's okay to even, you know, assess, because here's the other thing too. And I, I've lived, I do this all the time in the spaces I'm in, is sometimes folks come in with their needs met, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes folks come in with their assistive technology. A lot of my students come in with their access needs met. So, and therefore they don't have a need that 
I have to go resource. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just was trying to kind of, it's kind of a relational thing. That's that mutual, that trauma informed piece, you know, that mutuality shared support. Sometimes accessibility becomes a relation. It becomes relational <laughs> real quickly, you know? And so if I can add to that, there's also the option of every person who lives with a condition that may or may not need accommodation to opt out of those accommodations, yeah. knowing it will impact their experience. There's no mandate to disclose. There's only disclosure to then help get needs met better or more effectively. But if you're okay with the experience you have without disclosing whatever it is, that's that person's right too. Mm -hmm. If you know somebody who shows up to your class has a condition and they just haven't mentioned it to you, you can offer choices to the whole group that you know might benefit this person based on the condition. But don't go up to them and say, oh, I know you need this block because your torso is so much longer than your arms. Like, suggest to everyone, let's, you know, see what happens here if we put our hands on our blocks. Everybody gets the opportunity, and then the other person who may not even realize that they need it has just had something normed. So here's an example, then I have to get going, but here's an example, captions, okay? Here's right here. When I'm, I had a student, I had a, I did a training a couple of weeks ago. Someone um, I knew prior to, there was someone that had a hearing impairment, okay? And I always do captions, but then, so we, we ran him, okay? Because there's a lot of folks that come in from, you know, with, that have that sensory um, disability. And, um, but then I had someone else email me and um, they were like, hey, thank you so much for offering the transcription because I was traveling and I couldn't hear, um, I couldn't listen because the, cause the uh, um, because my Wi-Fi was out, but I got to read the transcript in the car. Okay, so example, we brought it in for access and someone benefited, right? So, and it was offered to everyone and it'll be offered to you too. <laughs> Um, Carrie, is Carrie still on here? Okay. Nope. Carrie had asked about the observation about remote work and universal design principles and representation. So, do, um, do you think the group should avoid topics that can be voiced by someone with lived experiences? And this is more of an observation than the debate over remote work is a lot about understanding universal design principles. Does this experience provide an opportunity for more understanding? Um, okay, do you want to speak to any of that? <laughs> I think really when we're looking at representation, should we avoid conversations because there's not somebody of that group in the room? I think we need to be very clear that there's not somebody of that in the room and that there, the things that we're discussing around that topic are innately biased because we don't have representation there. If everybody acknowledges that what we're saying in this conversation could be totally wrong. You can still have the conversation. Just know that again, it's an incomplete conversation. Hi everyone, I'm leaving. Natasha's gonna fuck ended out <laughs> yep all right julia make just make sure when you leave that you're okay. just leave rather than you ending the meeting for everybody because right that's that's so easy to do i just made you the host awesome <laughs> hopefully that works <laughs> okay cool it should work all right bye everyone thank you i'll send you a follow-up email tomorrow okay <laughs> all right so I want to just open the floor here for any questions that the rest of you may have. Uh, again, my email and, con and contact information in general is in what you have. Feel free to reach out to me directly, um, really, if anything has come up today that you're just you're still unclear about. If you want a specific example dialogued out, you know, happy to do that with any of you. All right, so if there aren't 
other questions or comments or thoughts, then uh, we're going to go ahead and close out. Thanks so much for showing up and being a part of the discussion. Um, as always, we are available to assist you on this learning journey uh, in whatever way. And if we're not the right person to get your question answered, we can send you on to the person who is the right person. Thank you so much, Natasha. You're so welcome. Thanks Thank for coming. <laughs> it was so great. Thanks so much. Yeah, you thank you. Hi. You are so welcome. Thanks for the active participation. Yes. Good night, y'all. Have a great fun. one. Thank you.